we're going to cover chapters 21 through 23 tonight. And at this point in the book of Acts, it's the flow is a little different because uh, it's Paul making his way to Jerusalem. And so the, the, the pace and the flow changes some. And it's not, it, it, it's not the way it has been really in the, the uh, front, the, the, re- the earlier portion of the book. But I want to go back to chapter 19 uh, and the story of uh, Paul and the 12 Ephesian, me- Ephesian men and their rebaptism, as we often hear it referred to. I want to just point something out there real quick, and then we'll jump into 21 through 23. But uh, if you notice that Paul handles this situation in the same way that Priscilla and Aquila uh, handled the situation with Apollos, right? And we went through the story last week, so I just want to highlight some things uh, that I've, some takeaways really more so from, from the story. So you know that in chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, uh, there's the case of the 12 Ephesian men. And if somebody would read chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, just to orient us to what's happening there, and then we'll look at some takeaways. Somebody read verses 1 through 7 for us. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took a road through interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was the baptism of repentance told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, there were about 12 men in all. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so we see what happened. We talked through, uh, examined. Uh, the, the, what was happening in terms of them being baptized again last week. So we, we're not going to repeat that this week. What I want to take a quick look at is what we can learn from the approach that Paul, and also Priscilla and Aquila with Apollos, but that Paul took with the Ephesian men. So based on what you see there, based on uh, what you know about Priscilla and Aquila, what can we learn from their approach? We can learn that say, hey, you're not getting it. Hey, you're not thinking. Yeah. You need to know. You may not know, but you need to know. Mm-hmm. It could have been cocky. Yeah, yeah, could have been cocky, stuck up. Yeah, sometimes uh, we might find ourselves. Yeah, I know more than you, yeah, and I'm going to let you know it. Yeah. yeah. Knowledge puffs up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Good. What, what other things do we see from their approaches? Put on Christ. Right. And Paul was concerned about that, so he made sure they understood that when they were baptized into Jesus, they actually came in contact with the blood of Christ and yeah. put on Christ. Paul was genuinely concerned about them, and he uh, wanted to see that they <laughs> obeyed accurately the, the gospel. Yes, sir. Well, the other thing is the way that Paul is saying it, he's just stating. Yeah, and that's all they knew, it seems. Yeah, yeah. very good. And But he continued after that. Yeah, he had more to say. But he started with where he knew they were. Yeah, yeah. very he good. He asked them a question, which gave him a lead in. Yeah, he just asked questions, yeah. yeah. They, they opened themselves up to that. They went to the right people. Good, very good. 
Other thoughts, observations? I just take this non-judgmental approach. It's to appeal to people's open minded. Like they didn't, they didn't resist. They said, "Well, yeah, I guess we do." And they didn't find that bad. Yeah. So sure. I don't know what where we get the discourse to the call, but it seems like that approach appeals to getting people to think that maybe the question can become their their response to the question. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. He just a open minded approach, not critical. And it was a way that they would receive. He communicated with them in a way they would receive that and think through it. Other thoughts? He also sets forth the fact of the preeminence of the Holy Spirit. If you receive the he Holy brought Spirit, up the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. Spirit. Yeah. So within, what, a couple of questions, he really knew what he needed to know. So here's some, I, I think, i captured what you guys have said. Uh, here's, I think, what we see. We see that Paul cared about them. First and foremost, he cared about them. If he didn't care, he wouldn't be taking, he wouldn't give them a time of day. Uh, he was curious, he was interested in them, and that meant that he was going to ask good questions. So he, he cared about them, and he wanted to know the state of their spiritual life, of their of how they stood with God, of their faith. And so he, because of that curiosity, and I think like what Brother Gary's getting at, when you approach somebody in a situation like this, and in and, and and both cases, they just assumed they were Christ followers. I mean, they, they just didn't know better. And he approached them in a caring way, and he approached curious and in a curious and interested way. He wanted to get to know them, and he, and like you might think of like a a, a good uh, reporter, where they're asking questions because they're curious. I want to learn from you. I want to I want to hear where you're at, not to set you up as Doug was alluding to, not to prove you where you're wrong and show you how smart I am. But let me let me learn something from you. Let me pull this out of you. And and of course he was getting to know what he needed to know, learning what he needed to know so that he could take them where he wanted them to go, right? He asked good questions and then what did he do? He lovingly taught them the truth. And that's what we see Priscilla and Aquila do. They they call Apollos aside and it's possible they even uh, had him over to their house to study with him and teach him more accurately the way. So another thing that I, I think we notice that Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul do in these two cases is, uh, is these two things. They didn't condemn and they didn't condone. Think about those two words, and in what ways did they not condemn, and in what ways did they not condone? Yeah. Yeah. He didn't say, "Well, you're going to hell." You know how people do. <laughs> they just—they're going to let you know. You know. That's not what they did. They didn't come out condemning. Because that's going to what? Just shut the door. I mean, that, yeah, that repels. You don't want to be approached like that. And nobody else. It, what's that? It has been done and it will be done. Yeah, yeah, people. Yeah, everybody loses. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. You walk up to somebody and say, "You did this, brother. What have you done? You know." Yeah. And then, like you said, here comes the steel wall coming down. Mm -hmm. And if you let it, if you approach them like you said about what happened to them, it, it was much more responsive, and you got a better response and a better attitude. 
Yeah, how you approach that. Yep. yep, very good. And, uh, you know, you can look back at books like from Dale Carnegie and others and, and whether they acknowledge God or realize that there, there's something there that, that Paul certainly understood and that we see uh, Priscilla and Aquila did as well. Now, they didn't condone. In what way did they not condone? What, what does that mean? Yeah. That's yeah. Good. Now, isn't that what we do in in um, with American Christianity now? Oh, oh. Well, I respect that. I, that's really different. And and you know, in your mind, no, that that's crazy. Or you know, in your mind, no, that that's that's not what the Bible teaches. Oh, well, well I really respect that. You know. Oh, is that how you? Oh, you know, that's what we do. Oh, okay. Or that's close enough. <laughs> yeah, close oh, enough. Not that yep. there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Are you referring to the Seinfeld episode? So in not condoning, you're, instead we see that he raised questions and he connected what they did understand, John's baptism. He said, okay, let me, there's, there's more information that you don't have. And as an apostle, let me, let me finish the story for you. They did it in a way that they gladly received the word. And uh, we, we see that often in the, in, in the book of Acts, don't we, that we gladly, that they gladly receive the word. Okay, let's do some quick summaries to get us to uh, chapters, chapter 21. Beginning of 19, he meets resistance in, in Ephesus, uh, does ministry in Asia. Then we have the seven sons of Siva. Uh, they're revealed as frauds. Uh, but what good came of this? A lot of people believed and even burned all of their books of magic and, and you know, scrolls and things like that. And so it, even though it was a strange and difficult situation, it actually brought about people uh, believing uh, their message. And then uh, there was also this uh, riot in Ephesus due to the spread of the gospel. That's a, a big event. So you see how kind of the, 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 the flow of things, it's just kind of the, the, the events as he travels is the way that Luke is writing. He travels more after the riot. Eutychus raised from the dead in Troas because Paul preached so long. I would submit to you it's probably because Eutychus stayed up too late playing video games or something, and it wasn't Paul's <laughs> fault. Just something to consider. I always want to blame the preacher. <laughs> So uh, then Paul heads to Jerusalem for Pentecost, but stops in to see the Ephesian elders, a very touching, wonderful moment there. They're very close. They cry. Uh, uh, God, he, through, through Paul, God gives them wisdom and warning, which he later writes to them about in his letter to them. Then we get to chapter 21. And uh, he arrives at Philip's house. We'll pick up in verse 7. There's a little bit more travel. He arrives at Philip's house in Caesarea. Okay? Let me go over there. Now, in Caesarea, he arrives at Philip's house. Philip uh, has four unmarried daughters, and they prophesy, we're told. And 
And we're told that the Ephesian uh, men, they began to prophesy and speak in tongues. God used these gifts in the first century to help confirm and spread the gospel. Then the prophet Agabus shows up and he prophesies. And now what does he prophesy? What does he do? And then what is he, what's his prophecy to Paul? And, you know, we might wonder, well, is this legitimate? We later learn that this was legitimate. God was uh, communicating through a a Agabus. So what does, what does Agabus prophesy? What does he do there in verse 11 through 16 of 21? What does it say? Coming to us, he did what? Yeah, this is how, this is what's going to happen to you. Where? In Jerusalem, okay? Make a mental note of that, all right? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be back there later. We'll see something later. So now, do the, do the Christians there want Paul to, to go? No, they're, they're begging him, stay. But Paul says, I got to go. He knew what he needed to do. Now notice, God did not, through Agabus, tell Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. He said, here's what's going to happen. And Paul went and did what he needed to do. He knew he needed to return to Jerusalem. He doesn't know it will be his last time to go to Jerusalem. Okay, look at verses 20 through 22. Uh, somebody read that of chapter 21, and let's see, what is the situation? He gets to Jerusalem. He finds James, who is really the, the, the apostle leader there in the congregation along with the elders. And uh, he goes to James. He gets with the elders of the church. And uh, Paul describes the, what, the work that God has done through, through him uh, among the Gentiles, the great ministry that's been happening. They rejoice. And then in verse 20 through 22... What do we find out is a situation happening? Somebody read 20 through 22. When they heard that they were being glorified in God, they said to him, You see, brothers, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all, and they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Telling them not to be circumcised as children, nor to walk according to their custom. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Okay, does does that make sense what's happening? Do you can you can you picture that? So they hear the good news and they say, Okay, we gotta tell you about a situation. There are thousands among the Jews who have become Christians. And yet they are zealous for the law. Remember we've talked about how this was such a major change for the Jewish people who realized the Messiah has come and they became Christians. This was a total life change for them. Okay, And there are some that were still zealous for the law. They were still struggling with this. And they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Now, was that is that accurate? No, but that's how word gets around, right? That, that's not accurate. But telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to their customs. So it's not totally accurate, but they know that Paul was carrying the message of what had been agreed to for Gentile Christians, you know, back in the Jerusalem Council, right? But, you know, word gets around and it's changed and they're telling me, they're, you're telling everybody, just forget Moses and all that. Paul had great respect for the law. But there's a situation on their hands that needs to be dealt with. And they say, 
what are we going to do? They're going to know that you're here in Jerusalem, Paul. All these Jews who are Christians but zealous for the law, and they hear that you're telling other Jews elsewhere, don't worry about it. They don't understand. What are we going to do? And they have a suggestion for Paul. And so they say in verses 23 through 26, here, do, do this. Do what we tell you to do. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses. So there was a, a fee to kind of go through the process of preparing for this vow uh, so that they may shave their heads. Uh, thus, all, see, there were barbers back then and they got paid. They were, they were all, will know that there's nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance to the law but as for the Gentiles who have believed, verse 25, remember, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should, uh, what, abstain from uh, food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what's been strangled, and from sexual immorality. That's the, from what they agreed at the Jerusalem Council. And they said, we need to show everybody here in Jerusalem visibly that you follow the law, you, you, you know, you don't, you hadn't thrown the law totally out, you respect the law, but Gentiles don't have to follow the law, and that's what we meant. So Paul took the men, the next day he purified himself, and they go into the temple and giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and offering presented each one of them. Uh, so then they go into the temple, all right? So everything seems fine. Paul does it, why? Why does Paul go through? Why didn't Paul say, well, they just need to grow up. They just need to, you know, come ask me then. Uh, why does Paul go through this trouble? Yeah, he, he loves his fellow Jewish people. He is Jew and a Jew. So, so he does this because he wants them to be, their faith to, to be fine. He doesn't want to lead anybody astray. He doesn't want to be a stumbling block for anybody. So he says at one point somewhere, I'll, I'll put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. So he submits himself uh, to this, but verses 27 through 29, we learn it doesn't go too well. Why? Because there are some Jews from Asia who are not Christians and they lie about Paul. Anybody know what the lie is that they told about Paul? Look in verse 28. They lie about him. And they say, he brought a Greek into the temple and has defiled the temple. Now, what are they talking about? Because they had, pre verse 29, they had previously, previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed Paul had brought him into the temple. He went into the temple with these other guys. He must have had Trophimus, that Gentile, in there with him. And they make up a lie that they stir up the city and things go nuts, okay? Didn't go well. So uh, there is a, there is a, uh, there's an uproar. They're actually beating Paul. They've dragged him and there's an uproar. The commander or tribune, uh, he's a commander in that local area, the city, and uh, he's got up to a thousand soldiers under his command and he dispatches his soldiers to calm everything down. Remember, Rome wants order. Calm down, and they will bring the soldiers in to bring order. They get Paul out of there and put him in the barracks. They don't know what's going on. They put him there. It separates everybody, gets him into safety. And the commander, he can't figure out. He can't get a straight answer from anybody. So he doesn't know, what are y'all fussing and fighting about? What has Paul done? He's hearing different things. You know how it goes. Nobody knows in a and a big mob. We see that right on the college campus. Nobody knows what they're doing there. They're just doing that because somebody else is there. They saw it on, on social media. Um, and they have no clue what they're doing. But that's what this was. I mean, they just all join in and they don't know what they're doing. Paul asks the command, asks to speak to the commander. The commander recognizes, he, he says, you speak Greek. And he, he recognized that Paul did. And what happens in the commander's mind uh, look at verse 37. In the commander's mind, when he hears him speak Greek, he assumes, 
you must be that Egyptian who recently stirred up a revolt and let uh, and led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. You must be like the old Western movies. You must be the outlaw we've heard about. I've seen your poster hanging on the wall of the marshal's office. And, uh, but then Paul replies, no, I'm a Jew. I'm from Tarsus. So the commander realizes, okay, this isn't the Egyptian guy we've been looking for. And then Paul asks to speak to the crowd. Now, this is interesting. Uh, this, the commander gives him permission. And somebody read verse 40 for us of chapter 21. Okay, interesting. What do you notice? What do we notice in these last few verses right here when he's with the commander? When it comes to language. Hebrew, Aramaic is very, very similar. And sometimes uh, when Hebrew is mentioned, it includes Aramaic. Uh, but whether it's Hebrew or Aramaic, it says Hebrew, but they're, they're, they come from the same they're like sister languages. Uh, he's speaking Hebrew, but wait, he, I thought he was just speaking Greek. Okay, so we know Paul's a smart guy, right? He, he knows a lot of things. He knows uh, multiple languages. Why is this important in speaking to a crowd of Jews who are ready to kill him? Why is this important? Because he... Huh? What's that? Communication... But what does him speaking the uh, Hebrew language signify to all these Jewish people who would have also known Greek? One of them. And Hebrew was the language of God's people, Israel. So it, it gives him credibility there. to, to and, and it says to them, listen to what I'm saying. I'm one of y'all. I go way back. I mean, I, I'm a Jew too. Don't, don't, don't mistake who I am. He speaks their native language, if you will. He tells them, now we're in chapter 22, and that first part, the majority of chapter 22, he tells them about who he is, where, is, where, is he, where he's from, and he tells his conversion story, okay? And it's all going fine up until the very end. What does Paul say at the very end in verse 25 that derails the train? Not that Paul made a mistake, but he's telling his story and what God has done with him. But what does he say? Somebody look at verse 25. No, I'm sorry. Look at verse 20. Somebody read verse 21. And the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Oh, boy, you were going good until you said, <laughs> God, you, you speak Hebrew, and you're saying in the Hebrew language, talking to Jews, you're saying God sent you to the Gentiles. Boy, that's about as bad as it could get. In their minds... And so look at, somebody read verse 22. Look at the way Luke tells us how they responded. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Whoa. Up to this word, they listened. And when he said Gentile, they said, kill him. He doesn't deserve to live. That, and you talk about zealous, well, they weren't the, they weren't the Christians, but they were, they, they were zealous for uh, the law, all right? So they're shouting, they're throwing their cl cloaks, and they're going crazy. The commander has to step in with his soldiers again and get Paul out of the situation. But we learn in verse 25, the commander, he still doesn't know what's going on. He takes Paul back, you know, to the barracks and stuff, 
And he strings them up, and he's about to do what? He's going to, why is he going to flog him? Why would he he's do that? He's trying to get the truth out of Paul. Yeah. Why are they so mad? Yeah. You know, yeah. when you spank your kids, you, you spank them all. Tell me who broke the, you know. No. <laughs> but, but he's like, I'm going to beat the truth out of you. If I can't get it from them, I'm going to get it out of you. And right before they start swinging, what does Paul say? That changes everything. I'm a Roman. He asks a question, doesn't he? He said, you supposed to do this? <laughs> Is it legal? Now, Paul knew the law better than those guys, probably. All right, and that, that got them scurred at that point because they were about to make a huge mistake. Now, the commander seems like a decent guy, we learn later he's got a little bit of personal agenda in there. Uh, probably all of them uh, would have naturally in terms of promotion and all that. But he seems like a decent guy, and he stops. He don't want to break the law. Uh, he don't want to do something he's not supposed to do. Why is that significant that Paul was Roman, and why did that stop everything? Yeah. They, they had certain, uh, spe they got special treatment, and most of it had to do with, had come to the, the law and, and the court system, legal system, and all of that, all right? Now, we don't have time to get into this, but for further study, if you're interested, you can look into Paul's identity. What do we know about Paul's identity? First of all, he was, what, what was his ethnicity and Originally, his religion. Huh? He's Jewish, right? Okay. And now what do we learn? That he's also Roman, a Roman citizen. Now, three times in the book of Acts, Paul talks about this, and I think chapter 16 is the first time, and then he'll use it later to appeal to Caesar <coughs> and how he gets to Rome. All right? And he's also Christian. That's an odd, I mean, that's a unique combination. And look at how God was at work to get Paul, who's a Jew, devout, intelligent, successful, Pharisee, possibly on the Sanhedrin, studied under Gamaliel, the man. And he's a Roman citizen. He tells the commander later, by birth. He was born as a Roman, okay? And then he becomes a Christian. Now, Matt sent me a really good article from Christianity Today that got into this, and in particular, one possibility of how Paul or his parents or grandparents became Roman citizens uh, could have been through slavery. Uh, another possibility is it could have been through military service of his father or grandfather. Another possibility could have been in Tarsus, they were, uh, of, uh, they, were, they were well off, they were of noble status, and when Rome was conquered by Pompey the Great, uh, he would gift citizenship to some of the nobility in order to win favor, all right? If you're interested in learning more about that, you can look that up, Matt or I could send you the article uh, but that, that's interesting, and the God is at work using him in this unique way, and he plays this card uh, three different times. He doesn't use it until he needs to. Yes, sir? Do you think also that maybe uh, the friends who knew Paul before he became a Christian and how he used to persecute people and things like that, that maybe they, they thought, uh, Paul's just a Jew. You know, we're going to cut him some slack and, you know, and, and just kind of be there for him. Maybe he got some little special uh, favors here and there because of who he was before and what he's going into right now and what he's being put uh, yeah. yeah, Yeah, especially any Jewish person who was uh, sympathetic to Christianity, even if they hadn't converted. Yeah, yeah, you, you, quite possibly. So the commander then, who he had the right to do this, verse 30, he orders the Sanhedrin to assemble. So 
he, they have to kind of scramble to get together the next morning. And he says, okay, we're going to sort this out. We're going to deal with this. He's a Roman citizen. i got to figure out what's going on. So he says, Sanhedrin, we're meeting tomorrow. And uh, uh, he, ta he takes Paul personally down there, and he stands there as they go before the Sanhedrin to sort this out. Now, chapter 23, chapter 23, somebody read verses 6 through 11, and just pay attention to what is intelligent, Paul doing? He's kind of being, he's being kind of sneaky here. He does something really clever. Somebody read 6 through 11 of 23. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, the dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, the dispute became so violent Commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Very good. Okay. So we learned something about his father or grandfather, great grandfather. One of them was a Pharisee. Okay. Interesting. But look at what he says that after that. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. It's almost like he turns to the camera and says, watch this. <laughs> and he throws resurrection out there, which is true. That's what he's doing is proclaiming the Messiah. Jesus rose from the dead. He is the Messiah. That's his message. Repent and believe and follow him. But he knew what would happen. And he, I mean, he knew, and, and he, he knew what he was doing. He, he used to, he's on the other side of things now, right? He knew how they operated. He didn't necessarily know everybody there. It's only been about 20 years, uh, scholars think. So he would have known probably some people still there. May not have known who the chief priest is because he, you know, he said something he didn't mean to be disrespectful. He probably didn't know who the guy was. Some say maybe his vision was already going bad uh, or because the commander told him, hurry up, y'all get together. You know, they're not sitting all in the right chairs with all their fancy clothes on for whatever reason. But uh, Paul doesn't mean to show disrespect initially. He tells the chief priest that. But he knows what he's doing to get them all going at it about the resurrection, about Jesus. And then the scribes are like, y'all, he ain't done nothing wrong. And they're, it just, they just get so fired up. The commander, who again seems like a decent guy, gets him out of there. And uh, then, then what happens after that? Verses 12 through 35. A group of Jews decide, okay, okay, uh, we just, we're going to kill this guy. And then 40 people decide they're going to kill him. They go to the Sanhedrin. And they get them involved. They say, we're going to do this, and you're going to play your part. His nephew finds out, right? And the plot is spoiled. Uh, the commander gets Paul out of there by night, sends him to Caesarea, gets him by night halfway there. And uh, what happens in Caesarea? We'll end on that. He gets to Caesarea. Can you imagine coming in with all these soldiers, possibly in chains? He's dirty. He's hot. He's been traveling. And uh, he gets to Caesarea. And what do you think the Christians there are thinking? Because he was just there. And who said what? When he was in Caesarea last time. Agabus? 
And what did Agabus say? You go to Jerusalem, here's how you're going to leave. Remember that? And that's how he left Jerusalem. You see, God was at work, and Paul was being faithful no matter what happened. And the governor, Felix, puts Paul in Herod's palace, which is where the governor lived. It was built as a palace. Now it's the governor's residence. So now he's in a, a, a secure place, safe from the mob. He's in a safe house. And he kind of gives him free reign within that space for two years. And then we'll pick up next week, 24 through 26. So yes, ma'am. Yeah, that, that's a great question because uh, we gonna, we're going to learn in 24, they arrived. Yeah, did they ever eat? You know, how serious were they? Or were they just angry and going off? I bet they broke their vows. There had to be some McDonald's along the way. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry we went over.